In this video we're going to take a look at Hellbound, which was a pwn challenge from the recent Hack the Box Cyber Apocalypse CTF 2022 Intergalactic Chase. And unfortunately I'm not able to access the after event here. Normally you should be able to go in here to access the challenge files and to access the remote servers for the challenges, but I don't seem to have the option to access that or to join it or anything. I can have a look at the previous CTF, but again we can't actually download any of the files or view the descriptions or connect to the server or anything like that. Luckily I have the files downloaded for the challenge that we're going to take a look at which was this one Hellbound. You can see it got 127 solves and it's a return to win style challenge using a heap exploit which is something I've not done a video on before and although I missed the CTF as I was uh, visiting family in England I thought I'd come back and take a look at this after having a look at some of the walkthroughs. I thought this would be a cool one to do a video on. So, yeah, we're not going to be able to do it remotely, but we can have a look at things locally. And if the remote server was there, you know, it's just a case of running it against that. I've already downloaded the files, so you can see here we get a glibc folder, which actually has all of our libc library stuff in here. And the binary is patched to use that. So if we actually have a look, ldd hellhound... You can see it's actually set to use the libc in this glibc and again we can have a look at file hellhound and yeah we've got a 64-bit binary and again you can see here it's set to use the interpreter in this glibc folder so in some challenges if it comes with the libc library we would use pwn in it or something to patch the binary so that it uses the libc that we've downloaded but in this case that seems to have all been done for us and we can just get working on the challenge. So first of all let's run checksec and see what protections are enabled on the binary and just to talk through a few of these we've got Relro enabled so this just refers to the readability and the writability of the global offset table so it looks like we're not going to be looking to overwrite anything in the global offset table in this case. We've got a stack canary so if we do have a buffer overflow here then we would need to worry about this canary because if we overflow the buffer and this canary value is overwritten with something that it didn't it wasn't assigned to at the beginning it's going to come up with stack smashing detected and crash the program at the end and then nx enabled so if there is a buffer overflow and we're able to bypass this canary maybe leak it out and enter in the correct one we're still going to have to worry about this this means that we can't execute arbitrary code on the stack and we would need to look at something like rop so maybe return to libc or something like that and no pi, so this just means every time the program loads it's going to have the same base address which you can see here and then we've just got to run past. So that's all good. Just before we open this up in Geodra and take a look at the code let's go ahead and run the binary. You'll see we've got three options here. We've got analyze chipset, modify hardware and check results. So we'll start off with option one and it gives us this number, the serial number. What I'm going to do is close that down and just do that again it's a good thing just to check to see if this is a different value each time and it is so it's probably leaking out some address for us let's try and enter in 2 and it asks us to write some code so we might try to overflow the buffer here just to see do we get anything but we know that we would only get that stack smashing detected anyway even if there was a buffer overflow there and finally we've got this check results which we can enter and it says the beast went berserk again and that's it. We can do three again and now we get a segmentation fault. So there's something going on there. Let's open this up with Geodra. I'm going to use this Geodra auto script which just speeds up the process a bit. It imports it and analyzes it automatically. So I'll speed through this a little bit more anyway. Okay, so just in case anybody isn't familiar, we've got our program sections here in the top left. We've got our symbol tree here so we can have a look at our functions, our imports, our exports, things like that. We've got our assembly code here on the left and then we've got our decompiler on the right. So whenever we go to a function like main, it's basically going to decompile that. So it's going to give us very close to what was the original C code. And then whenever we click somewhere in this code, it's going to jump to that area in the assembly. And then vice versa, if we click somewhere in the assembly, it's going to show us what that refers to in the decompiled code. What I like to do here is start renaming things. So we have our canary here at the beginning. I'm going to type L, which will open up this rename panel and then rename that to canary. And essentially this is being assigned this random value at the beginning. And whenever we get to our return, so return is here, 
you can see before it actually returns it's going to make sure that that canary still equals the value that it was assigned to at the beginning so if there was a buffer overflow here and we were to overflow our buffer and overwrite that canary we'd be in some trouble when we get down here we get the stack check fail so that's the first thing the other thing here is our buffer so I'm going to rename this this is a pointer array so we've got eight pointers and that's adding up to 64 bytes so we've got eight bytes we've got eight bytes and we've got 64 bytes and then eight bytes again and we've got our setup we've got our banner nothing of interest really there we've got this printf let's have a look and see what this is in the data section and that's our menu you can see here one two and three so I'm going to rename that to menu options and we know that that's reading in the option so I'm going to change that to option as well so this is taken in the option off us it's going to check if it doesn't equal two break and it's going to ask us to write some code so we already had a look at that let's start off at the option one so if option one it's going to print out and you can see here it's actually printing out the buffer so that decimal value that we saw is actually printing out the address of our buffer on the stack which is going to be important we've also got the option three so option three down here it's saying if the option is not equal three down here otherwise it's going to go down here so if the option equals three this is what's going to happen it's going to change the buffer zero so the zero element of the buffer the first pointer to equal the next value along so it's basically going to move that chunk one eight bytes along the other option was our option two so it was the last one that we haven't looked at which asked us to write some code and you can see here it's reading in 32 bytes into this 64 byte buffer so whenever malloc's called it's allocating a chunk on the heap of 64 bytes and whenever we go to write code we're actually writing 32 bytes of data into that chunk we've also got this other option here so it said down here if the option is not equal to 3 it must be equal to this one here which is 69 so if we enter 69 it's gonna free our the chunk that was allocated and it's going to print this out just to say the beast seems quiet and it's going to return so the goal here is for us to it's basically a return to win challenge so you can see we've got this function over on the left berserk mode off and this is just going to call system cat flag.txt so that's our goal our goal is to execute this function and there's nowhere in the main function that that's called so we want to overwrite the return address with the address of that function but we need to use the heap to do this so it's a bit different to the buffer overflow challenges I've quite often covered on this channel so the question is how do we overwrite that return address well we're given this leak towards the beginning so if we leak the buffer address we know that our buffer is 64 bytes we can see the layout of the stack here as well so we've got 64 bytes and then we've got 8 bytes and then we've got 8 bytes again so if we were to write 80 bytes we would then be at the return address which we could overwrite so if we leak this out and add 80 we're now pointing to the return address which we want to overwrite the other thing to remember is that we have this option 3 which is going to move the pointer one along so if we were to first of all enter well first of all we need to leak that address so it's going to be option 1 and then option 2 to write some code if we would supply 8 bytes of padding so it could just be 8 times a or whatever you want and then the address of our buffer plus 80 because we don't want the address specifically of the buffer we want the address of the return address which we can calculate based on the size of our total buffer here based on the size of all our local variables on the stack and then we call option 3 so option 3 because we have the padding to begin with option 3 is going to move that 8 bytes along so it's going to go past our 8 bytes of padding and now it's going to be pointing at our return address which is what we want to overwrite so we can now go back and do this option 2 again bearing in mind that the pointer is now pointing to the return address and we can then overwrite that with the address of the win function which in this case is called berserk mode off so we'll do that the only thing is whenever we then go to use our option 69 to return it's actually going to call free on our buffer 
and we don't want that so we want to create a fake chunk basically so rather than just simply overwriting the return address here we're also going to add on a zero or the address of a real chunk which we can free. I've used zero in the script after speaking to Roderick who put together some pwn write-ups which I've linked in the description I was a little bit confused about this step in the exploit so essentially the free either needs to be free zero or free a real chunk in order to basically not error out and go down to the return address so we'll create that fake chunk and then of course we need to move that along again so we need to move the pointer so we'll use option 3 again and then that'll be pointing at this fake chunk that we've created which means we can finally go and return hopefully I've explained that okay I'm not very good with heap stuff which is why I'm putting this video together and if I can't explain it properly maybe somebody in the comments can let me know what I got wrong or any incorrect assumptions I made. I'm just opening up the script that I put together now so just in case you haven't done many pwn challenges before or haven't seen the template that I normally use for these challenges let me just talk through it briefly. Essentially this stuff up here doesn't really change at all we've got a start function which makes it very easy to swap between GDB local and remote in this case I can't actually use remote because the I can't get the servers up but that's fine and we've got a GDB script so we could go and put breakpoints and stuff in here we've got our binary being set up, the context which just means that whenever we're packing addresses and stuff we don't need to specify whether it's 32-bit or 64-bit Pwn Tools will know all of that for us because it's just going to look at the binary and find out what architecture it is and then we can change our login level depending on how much output we want and that's basically it, you don't really need to change much here at all the important stuff is down here, this is where our exploit is so we start the program and you can see I've put plenty of comments in here and this script is up on GitHub in case you want to reuse it in future or take a look at it yourself but let me just talk through this bit as well. So this is basically just what we've talked through in Geardra but let me just reiterate it. So we're going to start off by leaking that address and in fact let me let's comment some of this out. Let's go through this step by step. So at the beginning we're just calling option 1 and then we're going to call this receive line. This is just based on our input and output so if we go back and run the binary again remember whenever we it asks us for some input we've got these two angular brackets here so we're saying whenever you see these two angular brackets send this line afterwards containing one and that's going to be the option one and then we want to extract this number so we're saying receive everything up until here which you can see right here so it's receiving everything up until that and then we want to receive the line after this but we don't want this bit at the end so I'm literally just stripping that out with uh, array indices here and then we're converting it into a base 10 integer and then we're going to print it out as hex so let's close that down let's do python exploit it's running through we've got loads of output because we have that debug mode on so you can turn that off you can change that to info if you want less output and you can see it's leaking out our stack address the next thing then is that we want this to point to the return address and we know from Geardra that we have a 64 byte buffer and we have the menu option which is 8 bytes and then we have the canary offset that was 8 bytes. We also had a canary but notice that that isn't, we just have to deal with whatever's above here on the stack. So that's it, we're calculating that and I mean we don't really need to run this again, it's just going to be the same plus 80 but you can see there this is the return address and let's go on to the next bit so the first thing that we're going to do here is going to be we're going to write 8 bytes of padding and the return address so remember we were saying this padding could be anything you can change that to just 8 A's I'm just putting a 0 and the flat function is essentially going to flatten these all down so because it knows what the context is it knows it's a 64 bit binary it knows to pack, the, pack this into a 64 bit address and it's going to pack this into a 64 bit address as well which is our return address so we have basically some padding of 8 bytes, the return address and then we want to move the chunk pointer forward so we want to move it past our 8 bytes of padding and we want it to point at this return address so the option 3 we know does that, option 3 is down here and it's going to move that forward 8 bytes so it's now pointing to the return address and we want to overwrite that return address so the next bit we're going to call option 2 which was option to write code again 
and this time we want to write over that return address with the elf.functions.berserk mode off, which is our win function, which is going to print the flag. But that's not enough. We also need a fake chunk after that, because otherwise, if we just have that there before it actually returns, it's going to free the buffer. So it's going to free that chunk, which is our the, over, the overwritten return address. We don't want that to happen, so we've put another fake chunk here. And remember, I've got this set to zero. You can't just set this to anything. Although this is just a fake chunk, you can't just set it to like a a a a a. It needs to be either a real chunk or a zero. If it's a zero, it's essentially just going to call free null, which won't cause any errors, won't do anything. And we want the we need to move the chunk pointer along to point to that. So we go back to option three again. That's going to move it to point to this zero. And then finally, we want to call free, which is going to free that fake chunk. And then it's going to return. And the return address at that, at that point should be the return address of the berserk mode off function. And therefore, should print us the flag. Hopefully that made sense. Let me, let's run through this. Python exploit. We run through that and you can see that we get back our hack the box fake flag for testing. So if the remote server, if we were able to spawn an instance on the remote server, which I'm not able to do, I'm assuming I just left this maybe too long, maybe there was only like 24 or 48 hours to join the after event, but it really doesn't matter. All we would have to do is do the same thing and then type remote in capital letters, put in the IP address, put in the port number, hit enter, and that would give us the remote server flag, which we could submit. Okay, that's going to wrap it up for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave them down below. Although if they are about heap exploitation, there's a good chance I won't be able to answer them. Uh, but if you noticed any mistakes I made or you solved this challenge differently and want to let me know how you did it, um, then let me know below. Thanks.